Hello and a very warm welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Media reports over the last few days have been reporting that the government is planning to raise non-tariff barriers on a number of products by putting in place product-specific monitoring systems or by allowing them only through licensing by adding them to the restricted list. Financial dailies have been reporting that various ministries including commerce, finance along with the line ministries are discussing the plan and a series of meetings are taking place in view of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's call for Atmanirbhar Bharat which would mean reduce import dependency and boost local manufacturing. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze what is import a monitoring system or mechanism. Joining me on the program today are Subhash Chandra Pandey, former advisor, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India, DK Agarwal, <laughs> President, PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and uh, Jayant Das Gupta, former ambassador of India at the WTO. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Mr. Pandey, I'd like to begin the program with you. Let's first understand and analyze the basic concept of import monitoring mechanism or system? Uh, you see, under Foreign Trade De Development and Regulation Act 1992, the Director General Foreign Trade in, in the Ministry of Commerce, Department of Commerce, is the nodal authority to uh, notify the regime for regulating imports and exports. From time to time, they come out with um, exim policies. The last policy was for 2015 to 20, which on from 1st April has been extended by one year. So under this policy, all the uh, goods uh, are classified into eight digit uh, Indian trade classification harmonized system codes, of which the first six digits are international classification and the last two are India specific uh, uh, further classification. So for each of these eight digit codes, there, the imports are uh, free unless put in this uh, specifically in three categories, restricted uh, requiring uh, imports or canalized where, um, means import only through designated agencies or prohibited altogether banned. So these lists are from time to time updated and generally these as part of the policy, the list is frozen. Time to time, as a dynamic response to situations, the changes are made. Very recently, for example, last week, cut flowers. They, it is in free list, free import list, but it has been stipulated that the import will be only through Chennai airport. So that condition has been added. Similarly, tires, they were in the free list, import list. It has been put in the restricted list. That means an import license will be required. So this is broadly the list and each importer exporter has to first obtain a registration with DGFT IEC code and on import he has to give full documentation giving details of what is being imported, what is the country of origin, what classification, what value, complete details. So this, in sum this is the uh, system for import monitoring. Okay, alright, since we are here then ambassador. Can the mechanism be different for different products or different sectors? Say, for instance, for steel, they can have certain set of restrictions and for something else, say for copper, they can have some, some, something else. Is, is, that, is that how it works or is it a, a one-fit-all kind of a mechanism? The import uh, monitoring mechanism can be different for different products depending on uh, which aspects of the product are uh, uh, you know, important for uh, uh, us. And uh, for instance, if there are certain chemicals which are coming into the country, which could have dual use, and uh, we could uh, try to find out if, you know, we, we restrict it only for a particular use. So we can always say that, uh, you know, what is the use to which you are putting it, to, going to put it to. So that is the kind of, uh, uh, you know, fine tuning which we can do to the import monitoring mechanism. As far as the steel uh, imports are concerned, for which we already have a monitoring mechanism since 2019, it is basically about uh, compliance with the Bureau of Indian Standards, which was put in uh, slightly earlier. And uh, that is what is sought to be um, uh, ensured through the import monitoring mechanism. And as Dr. Pandey mentioned, 
the unique registration number is given and only that needs to be quoted by the uh, importer at the time of uh, clearance of his documents by customs okay so uh, I'll, I'll 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 there are several aspects that need to be understood and that need to be taken forward i'll come back to both of you in just a bit but before that you know mr agarwal uh, how will non tariff barriers really help the industry and is this something that you're looking forward to uh if you look at there are two kind of uh, ways by which we can restrict import one is by putting tariff barriers which our government in last 5 years since 2014 we have uh, increased the tariff for almost 3500 items out of 11000 imported items but the other way is that uh, we have these non tariff barriers that is by way of uh, one is that online monitoring of imports where every importer before importing he has to register on the porter like we have uh, steel uh, import monitoring uh, system sims which is called so the importer has to register on the sim porter and once he registers he mentions how much quantity is importing from whom he is importing what is the value of the import and we, what is the country of origin so having these uh, online monitoring uh, parameters and then the other thing is that we have some quality standards being rolled out some technical specifications which are being uh, formulated so when these imports they happen then there is uh, they, we have to see that whether they are adhering to those regulations or not the other thing is uh, that uh, you know uh, uh, we have this uh, out of this non tariff barriers uh, one is that we have online monitoring system then other thing is we put them on re- on restricted uh, list and when we say restricted list that means uh, before importing they have to take the permission uh, from the government and there when you take the permission from the government then government can control the imports so uh, these uh, perform a very important objective one that government can take the necessary policy intervention which is required whenever it is required secondly there have been lot of instances where china and other countries they have been diverting their imports to other countries so to detect uh, that the uh, the country of origin and uh, if some if some country is not a producer of a particular item and if the imports are getting uh, are coming from that particular country like uh, recently it has happened from uh, hong kong lot of uh, import has uh, come from hong kong which was earlier uh, we had a surplus trade surplus now there is a uh, trade deficit of almost uh, 10 billion dollar you know suddenly the deficit has increased so there is a cause of concern and one has to look at how this import has increased whether there is a diversion from chinese manufacturers or uh, something else is happening so these policy interventions these controls are possible when you have this kind of uh, online monitoring system in place or restricted uh, category or restricted category so i think they uh, they perform a very important purpose and uh, as uh, our prime minister has given a clarion call and we have to become more uh, self reliant so i think this is a very important thing to do of course uh, industry is with the government and we as a chamber support this government move we would want uh, that uh, you know uh, there is always uh, uh, in this diversity you know uh, the country has uh, always come out victorious it might be a short term uh, uh, loss to some of the industries but overall this is going to be a long term gain and we support the move of the government okay all right since we are here then uh, mr pande how is this going to help indian companies and more specifically the make in india uh, initiative and indian manufacturers on the whole you see as as we just discussed the product specific import controls are based on quality public safety and other general laws and regulations the idea is not to discriminate between imported product and domestic product the uh, if a certain product is considered uh, to meet certain quality specifications certain standards and specifications those standards apply equally to domestically manufactured goods as well as imported you can only exempt imported goods from domestic quality requirement if they are meant for re export uh, if they are going for export to, uh, to being consumed by a different country then so one thing one has to be very clear that this is not a discrimination per se it is about in, uh, checking the ingress of poor quality imports being dumped that is why we also 
check uh, the uh, uh, second hand uh, waste uh, material etc which are uh, uh, come very cheap and they are destroying the domestic industry and they are harmful so it is the hazardous nature public safety angle which is important not really targeting any particular country or any particular product the basic philosophy is that many times we have been uh, we have not been as sophisticated in a, a regulating non tariff barriers and we have allowed a free uh, a free regime uh, much too free to the discomfiture of the indian industry leading to ingress of even substandard goods uh, uh, being dumped in the indian market okay so it's going to be a level playing field is going to be the same rules for everyone is what uh, ms pandey is suggesting you know uh, ambassador das gupta uh i just want taking a cue from there is uh, you know it's 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 a basic follow up question really on uh, will the mechanism uh, in any way impact our relations with other countries our bilateral relations because we've seen that happen with other countries in the past trade forms a very important part of uh, the bilateral relations with other countries and uh, if it is going to get affected uh, seriously because of the Uh, import mechanism uh, that we put in place, or the licensing procedures that we put in place, then there could be a, a fallout of that. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, if uh, we put uh, the same standards in the domestic uh, sector for, let's say, food products, let's say steel products, as we have done, and then we can also, that is open to us under the WTO regime, we can. Uh, have uh, uh, it notified that for imports as well we will require the same uh, standards to be met and for that if we notify it under the bureau of indian standards law then they the exporter will have to register first with the bis get its uh, quality tested get a certificate and then only it can export to india so these are some of the non tariff barriers or technical barriers to trade that can be put in in a similar manner for agricultural products and fisheries products we can have the sanitary and phytosanitary standards also come in and say that these are our standards for uh, import and we also are enforcing the same standards for domestic products so below this we will not allow you to sell and obviously not allow uh, things to be imported so this we can do legitimately and nobody no country can have any uh, quarrel with it but if we do it in a discriminatory manner if there is for instance uh, there are just two suppliers or exporters to india one of them enjoys a 90% uh, uh, market share of exports to india and the other one 10% then if we put it in obviously the one which has a very large market share of exports to india will get affected so hypothetically if such a restriction gets placed then there would be a cause for concern by the exporting country but uh, the final thing which uh, i wanted to underline is that whatever we do it has to be done on the basis of either a uh, scientific evidence that it is going to affect human health plant health animal health or that it is going to affect public safety or uh, it is going to uh, be against public morals so uh, there are a few exceptions which are provided under article 20 of the gat which was negotiated in 1947 so that these are the restrictions which we can legitimately enforce and nobody can quarrel with these restrictions but if we do things in a in a manner which is not wto compliant compliant then there could be problem okay so import monitoring mechanism or having some kind of import restrictions is one aspect but at the end of the day the industry too needs to step up uh, mr agarwal and deliver really as far as if you want to become a major manufacturing hub is the industry ready to face the challenge see uh, to put industry on the competitive uh, road map a lot has to be done even by the government and uh, there are many things uh, which we say cost of doing business if we look at the cost of doing business our cost of logistics we are almost uh, 10 to 12% uh, and uh, the world standard is around 5 to 6%
so we are in terms of cost of logistics we are much higher similarly if you talk of cost of productivity you know cost of labor could be cheap in india but if you look at cost in terms of productivity we are much much higher so we have to uh, change our laws the labor laws have to be very flexible and uh, the people need to be skilled so overall cost of productivity has to come down similarly the cost of compliance if you look at the so many compliances uh, in the life uh, cycle of a company uh, i was told in um, pharma industry almost 5000 compliances they have to do and for an average enterprise it is more than 2000 compliances they have to do so these uh, there is a huge cost of compliances that has to come down cost of land and uh, availability of land that is again something which uh, government has to work and then one window service of course many states have introduced one window service but there is no timeline that by uh, if uh, permissions are not received say within 15 days within 30 days then it should be a deemed permission so something like this has to be done cost of power cost of electricity i think this is again one item which uh, one has to look at we have to be competitive so we need to increase we need to reduce our cost of doing business i think that is very important so okay. uh, of course our government is doing a lot and we are very confident that uh, the way government is uh, bent upon doing a lot of reforms in terms of labor reforms in terms of enforceability of contract i think that is again a very important thing the enforceability of contract how much time it takes for a commercial dispute to get resolved i think these are the concern areas which government is uh, very well aware of and they are taking a lot of decisions and we are very sure that in next uh, maybe one year two year uh, the, uh, the road map is there so we should have all these thing in place and we would be very competitive Okay, I'll come back to you on a follow-up question on what kind of policy level changes that are required and what is it that industry is looking for ahead in the program. But taking the discussion forward for the time being, Mr. Pandey, you know uh, uh, there are several reports that have been doing the rounds now in the media about how there are at least 350 products that are going to come under this uh, import mechanism system. You know, are there any prime candidates? at the moment any any sectors that we need to watch out for specifically or any products that we need to watch out for specifically that may come under the mechanism so uh, you see but the import dependence is about 25% uh, especially if we are talking in in the context of china and it is across a, a large number of sectors uh, pharma automobile parts and uh, so the in in some of these sectors they they dependence is so deep and at such an intermediate level that immediate immediate uh, phasing out of dependence is not feasible it will take time to develop in course of time so the first uh, uh, target is primarily on the low tax consumer goods uh, uh, item uh, i uh, uh, for which the quality standards are a good uh, way to control and regulate this thing Uh, and the the and this has already been done we we have also done it through tariff barrier because in, in for many of the items our uh, actual applied tariffs have been much less than the wto bound rate so uh, uh, utilizing that gap we have for uh, but even now there is a in for many commodities there is a gap is still there and that gap can be utilized up to the wto bound rate but the low tech consumer items are the thing and apart from that is steel uh, 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 steel items and products which i think they will be the primary candidate but in due course of time as the import substitution progresses as the domestic capability develops uh, we can see it uh, uh, penetrating in more sectors right so ambassador what has her uh, experience been really as far as import restrictions are concerned can we expect the foreign companies to comply or probably cry foul going forward is that something that we need to watch out for and keep in mind if we uh, impose restrictions on uh, scientific evidence uh, then uh, nobody can uh, have a problem uh, or raise a problem with that so i don't think foreign companies will raise uh, a hue and cry about it but as far as uh, finished products are concerned you know uh, products like toys for instance or uh, consumer goods especially the low tech ones they are uh, 
it would be a slightly difficult uh, area to put in restrictions which would be based on quality standards because uh, there aren't very well defined quality standards for finished products and uh, those that are there can easily be met by foreign uh, companies so there would be a problem about uh, imposing uh, unilateral measures which are not based on as i mentioned the general exceptions of the wto and then sustaining that if uh, it comes to a dispute the experience uh, of uh, you know having import substitution uh, going forward is has been a mixed one as uh, dr mr agarwal mentioned we need to do a lot of things domestically to enable an industry to be set up and to then compete on a global basis because ultimately it is not the domestic uh, manufacturing sector and the market alone that will determine whether an industry survives or not it will be it will survive only if it is globally competitive and for that all the, the points that uh, mr agarwal mentioned will have to be taken into account and the government will have to pick and choose because it can't do everything for all the sectors at the same time and one of the factors which i uh, wanted to mention uh, which has perhaps been uh, not uh, uh, mentioned hitherto is that the cost of finance is very high in india because uh, the rate at which uh, finance is available to set up an industry for working capital requirements all these are much higher than the competitive competing countries and especially if you take china the hidden subsidies that china offers uh, through bank finance through uh, almost uh, negligible prices for land because land you can't really buy in china it is given on 30 year lease normally and the government uh, takes it back once you uh, shut down the industry so that the and the electricity rate these are the three four things which are of major concern and unless we help and we have taken initiatives in two of these areas electronics and pharma through the production linked incentive scheme that i feel is the way to go that is something which if we can replicate it in other areas which are of vital interest where our import bill is also high then we can perhaps uh, move ahead and make import substitution or uh, global competitiveness of indian products a reality absolutely all right so uh, mr agarwal what uh, you know policy level changes or what kind of hand holding do does the industry need to see or certain sections of industry need to see from the government if we have to take this push to the next level i would say that uh, land availability is uh, one of the biggest uh, issue you know if somebody uh, say some foreign investor they want to come to india then uh, if they approach any state you know it takes uh, almost a year to get the land with the required infrastructure so if our state governments if they can come forward with their land bank where all infrastructure is ready i think that can be a big uh, i'll say ease of doing business then people who want to invest into india and we are looking for a lot of fdi so that is i think the first thing and the cost of acquiring the land that is uh, second that even the cost has to be lower and then there has to be no issue with the title you know a lot of land reforms are to be done the records are to be digitized so all those uh, things are need to be in place and secondly as uh, you know what china did they created clusters like in india we have more than 730 districts so if you can look at the advantages of these districts what is the core competence what is the core strength and if you can develop uh, say for one or two products uh, we focus in each district and we create cluster industry clusters in those district and uh, we create uh, you know uh, common facilities in those clusters then uh, every unit because we have a lot of uh, msme and we are a country with uh, most of the msmes uh, taking the country forward so if you can have cluster based uh, you know system where a lot of common facilities are being set up uh, for those clusters and they can advantage take advantage of these uh, common facilities then their cost of production will also come down and their specialization would be there so i think these are some of the things which uh, if done and uh, as uh, ambassador also pointed out that uh, the cost of capital i actually i forgot and that is some of very important point still there is lot of scope in bringing down the cost of capital 
the even today if for an msme the cost of capital is very high so that has to really come down to a very uh, at least 3 4 3 to 4% gap is still there so unless until it comes to a level of actual availability to the msme sector if it is at the rate of 6 to 7% only then we can uh, think of making them a viable and uh, competitive uh, right. from the world perspective okay time now to get quick closing remarks from all my panelists i've got about 2 minutes left on the program so very quickly and briefly the best way forward starting first with you mr pandey the best way forward i i fully agree with mr agarwal they is to uh, further improve ease of doing uh, and uh, reduce cost of doing business it is indeed very high and lot of work remains to be done so i think without that in in, in the medium term Uh, the, uh, no, none of these measures are going to be sustainable so we we need it uh, latest by yesterday okay all right ambassador uh, uh, while uh, the import monitoring mechanism can provide us with a lot of details about the precise kind of product that is being imported so that we can start uh, taking initiatives to manufacture those in india for that uh, uh, toward that end it could be very useful but it should not disrupt the supply chain of the domestic manufacturing industry because it has also got interlinkages with exports so that is something which we need to be very careful about whenever we put in an import monitoring mechanism second point is that we should not unnecessarily waste the time and put an interest burden on our importer by making it cumbersome and time consuming so we need to be very transparent we need to be uh, quick and there has to be an automaticity about licensing if we put in uh, place a licensing uh, mechanism for the imports of certain products okay and mr agarwal close the show for us with the, with your concluding remarks uh, covid 19 has given us an uh, i'll say unprecedented opportunity where a lot of companies are thinking of moving out of china uh, moving their production facilities out of china so india should seize this opportunity and i will say india has the uh, capacity the bandwidth and the wherewithal so i'm sure that uh, this is a golden opportunity for us to become a world power okay all right on that note then i'll call it a wrap on this edition of uh, the big picture thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us what's coming out of this discussion is that if a living uh, level playing field is provided and decisions are taken in a scientific way then no one should have problems with it and we have uh, to have globally competitive industries and products we need to have the right cost of finance and the right kind of capital is also what the panelists are suggesting another issue that needs to be addressed is that of uh, cheap electricity at the moment of course uh, continuous and uh, uh, you know cheap electricity is a problem that too needs to be addressed and with the right kind of impetus and the right kind of incentives uh, we can scale new heights and we can ensure that we reach new levels is what the panelists are suggesting with that it's a wrap see you again next time